Hi, I'm Dr. David Bilstrom. I'm the medical director of the International Autoimmune Institute at Bingham Memorial Hospital. Our next installment was going to be uh, lab testing and interpretation of those labs. But I had an interesting question regarding uh, one of our first installments that I think deserves uh, some additional time. Uh, and I think this would be uh, a nice example, again, of how people get the autoimmune diseases. Now, one of our first installments, I talked about how uh, in the United States, currently one in 12 people has an autoimmune disease and one in nine women. But I also said that when we were looking for the right place to start uh, the first autoimmune disease clinic, we wanted to go someplace uh, based on the domestic and the international uh, tourism industry to make it uh, easy for people to come and get the care they need in a, in a very nice setting. Now the question that was asking me is, do people in other parts of the world get these same autoimmune diseases? Uh, and the answer is yes. So parts of the world where uh, the countries have become more industrialized and there's been a great deal of change in the way people eat and the types of food people eat, they develop the same rates of autoimmune disease that we do. So for example, Europe and Scandinavia have some of the very same rates of autoimmune disease that we do. Now, in, in our area here in southeast Idaho, when my wife and, and sometimes my children go hiking near, uh, take the afternoon and go hiking near Jackson Hole, and yes, uh, here in southeast Idaho, we can actually leave at two o'clock in the afternoon, go hiking for three and a half hours near Jackson Hole, have dinner and still come back before dark. Sometimes we go skiing in Sun Valley, Grand Targhee, or down near Salt Lake City, we hear a lot of people speaking foreign languages. And these foreign languages are a lot of the European languages and a lot of the Scandinavian languages, but also a great deal of people from Asia and Southeast Asia come here to visit as well. Now, those parts of the world are a great example of what drives its autoimmune disease. So in Asia and Southeast Asia, autoimmune diseases were almost unheard of a couple decades ago. Because of the changing economics in those countries, they now have the disposable income that allows them to travel uh, far away from home. But with the changes in those economics come some unwanted changes as well, such as a great deal of change in the types of food they eat and the quality of food they eat, as well as some of the environmental changes like toxicity. So I'm sure many of you have seen pictures of Beijing and all the smog and people wearing surgical masks. Well, you also see those kind of images coming from most of the large cities in Asia and Southeast Asia, whether it's Beijing, Tokyo, Kuala Lumpur, and Bangkok. Unfortunately, there's, there's also the big change in the food. Now, an example I would like to give is my wife, Joey, and I were fortunate enough to get a chance to go to Thailand about two decades ago. And while we were there, uh, we would try to eat in the mom and pop shops. Fantastic food, tiny little places right on the street. Mom and dad would be cooking the meal, grandma would be helping, grandpa would be at the table right next to us, helping the kids with their homework, just a lovely setting. And for 75 cents, we would get an amazing Thai meal. Now, at that same time, right down the street, you'd see more well-to-do Thai people. And I think the example is kind of the, the Thai teens, is rather than eating in that kind of traditional way, they're actually all sitting together eating a Kentucky Fried Chicken for the unheard of price of over $5 for a meal. So in that part of the world, people really can't afford those kind of meals unless they're pretty well-to-do. But with that added income, now they're eating a much less traditional way. And that goes also to even McDonald's and Pizza Hut. Now, uh, the body is fantastic at healing. And so if you're trying to try to make the body healthy, you don't have to be perfect. And this is kind of a recurring theme that you're gonna hear as we do these presentations, is you don't have to be perfect, you just have to be perfect enough. So of course, Jody and I, not being perfect, we ate at Pizza Hut. Now, the reason we did is, how can we pass up a squid pizza? You were in Asia, they have a squid pizza, we had to try it. Now, that's not the kind of food we're gonna to wanna to eat all the time, but you don't have to be perfect. But the thing is, with these big changes in the way people are eating, come a great deal of change in their immune systems, along with the toxicity, the change in environment. So what they're seeing is, in Asia and Southeast Asia, is as the economies change, the foods change, the environment changes, and as it turns out, the rates of increase of autoimmune disease perfectly mirror the rates of change in the economies and the environment in these countries. Now, as an example of the kind of toxicity that we experience in the westernized or industrialized nations, 
but the kind of toxicity that's building in the developing world is I'd like to direct you to kind of a scary map. It's a, a map that is on a website from the National Institutes of Health. And what I'd like everybody to do is to go to your computer and search for ToxMap, T-O-X-M-A-P. Now I like the ToxMap Classic, but there's also a ToxMap Beta. What you'll see on the ToxMap Classic is the map of the United States. And on this map are little tiny blue dots that represent identified toxic release sites. Now you know if there is a category of identified toxic release sites, there's going to be a lot of unidentified toxic release sites also. Now the big blue squares are super fun cleanup sites. And some of these have been cleaned up, but most of them haven't yet. But when you look at the ToxMap Classic site, you're going to see that the entire eastern half of the United States is totally blocked out by all the tiny red squares and the big blue squares. And the entire Pacific coast of California is blocked out by these same small red squares and big blue squares. And when you see that, you understand the extent of the toxicity that the human body has to deal with nowadays that we didn't have to deal with even a few decades ago. Now people may say, yes, we live in a more toxic world, but do they really get into the body? There's an excellent article published in 2006 where they wanted to try to find out if newborns had any identifiable environmental toxins in their blood at birth. And so what the scientists did is they decided to test for 250 different environmental toxins in the umbilical cord blood of newborns. Now they said, yes, there are tens of thousands of environmental toxins out there currently, but we're just going to check for 250 different kinds. Now on average, what they found was that there was over 200 identifiable environmental toxins in the newborn's blood at birth. The first thing the scientists said was, yuck. Now I'm kind of paraphrasing, but yuck is basically what they said. That's not good. They also said that knowing that there's tens of thousands of environmental toxins out there, that if they would have tested for more than 250, they're sure they, they're sure they would have found more than 200. So that gives an idea of how those toxins are getting into our systems, even at birth we're carrying a pretty high toxic load. So that's one of the challenges that the human body has in trying to stay healthy, but particularly given how detrimental those toxins are to the immune system, you can really see how the rate of autoimmune disease has climbed so dramatically in the last couple of decades. In parting, I'd just like to say, please remember, your body is always ready to heal, just needs to be given a chance. Bingham Memorial Hospital. Experience Bingham.